Today's title for the sermon is The Great Escape Part 3. And you may remember that we started the series looking at a story that happened on the 24th of March 1944. So towards the very end of World War II. And where prisoners of war escaped, it was actually soldiers from the German prisoner of war camp in Stalag Luft No. 3 that were situated within the Nazi-occupied Poland, 100 miles southeast of Berlin. And then the second part, we actually added on that they had formed a tunnel and it's through this tunnel that they had made that they escaped. In fact, if anyone wants to know more details, ask me over lunch because I was blown away with how many mattresses, knives, forks, um, tins they used, pillows to, to, to kill off the sound in the tunnels when they were escaping. Just an amazing story and you can even Google it yourself if you want to have a look. And then what we did is we, relating to that, we then we actually looked at a bird's eye view and a simplified version of the three angels' messages. And I mentioned that the three angels' messages, we weren't going to go digging deep into detail as today also when we look at Revelation 13. We're not going to go massively deep into all the details because we're wanting to take uh, finish off the completion of how the three angels relate to Revelation 12, 13 and 14. And remember the backdrop of Revelation, the book of Revelation is that there is a conflict. There's a cosmic conflict going on. There's a struggle bit over power. There's a, a struggle of, of a universal power, wanting universal power, and the struggle is between Satan wanting God's place. And so there's a struggle between Christ and Satan. And what we looked at also briefly last time is that in Revelation 12, it spoke of a great controversy in Revelation, Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9. And that there was a conflict in heaven. And so this conflict started in heaven, but then it moved down to the earth, which actually then really hit the ground, you can say, running when sin entered the world, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God by being lured and following the temptations of Satan. And then it gave Satan the supremacy over the whole world of, of evil coming in knowing that God is obviously all supreme, but Satan has been ruling and trying to gain as many of God's children to himself since then. And also what we learned is that Revelation is written in symbolic language and it's actually a prophetic book or an ap ap apocalyptic book. In other words, it's looking at prophecy, telling us what's going to happen in the future. And it also tells us um, uh, and those prophetic things all point towards the second coming of Jesus. What's going to happen before Jesus comes? And so to recap, the three angels' messages are then within that context. They're within that context. They relate to worship on who will you follow. They're the last warning message to the world that is perishing and they are given to prepare humans for the second coming of Jesus. They are given to prepare humans for the second coming of Jesus. And so what are the three messages? We find them in Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12, and there's the first angel. The first angel's message is that is, uh, talks about an everlasting gospel, uh, everlasting gospel, which means there's eternal good news of God's faithful love acted out towards us in Jesus Christ. So the first angel is taking an everlasting gospel to the world. The second angel refer, talks very much about Babylon. And it's about ancient Babylon. Ancient Babylon was characterized by self-exaltation, by confusion and both by false worship. And so it means there to, it's a, it symbolizes a global system that will be in the end of time that deceives and dominates the world. And so in other words, it's saying here that it's a man-made system, a man-made system. And it's about self-exaltation, confusion and false worship. And then the third angel 
warns of a coming global crisis in which worship laws will be imposed by, by this false Christian system. And as I mentioned, we're hoping, I'm hoping later in the year that we'll specifically look at the three angels' messages themselves a lot deeper. But that, that was the nutshell that we kind of looked at. And then what we, what we then did is it was, it was, we said that it's, it's to help us understand that they are hope-filled and not fear-filled. I know as I was growing up as a young child and into my teenage years or others that I've met have felt that a lot of the things in Revelation are fear-filled and that the three angels' message, especially when it's talking about um, come out of Babylon and, and the things that are relating there, that it's f filled with fear, but in fact they're filled with hope beautiful hope and so then what we did is we looked at revelation 12 just spent a whole sermon looking at revelation chapter 12 and what revelation 12 gave us it was a picture of a loving god who cares about you and me and that comes through throughout the bible but in revelation 12 we see this picture how do we see that because in Revelation 12, what Revelation 12 did is it introduced us to three key um, people, three, three, three key areas. You've got the woman that's mentioned there who represents God's people or the true church down through the ages. And the woman in the Bible, there's various texts. One of them is 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 21. Another one's in Jeremiah speaks of how a woman represents God's people, God's true faithful people, in other, or, or those that belong then to the true church because we know that church, ecclesia, the, German, the Greek word, not German, but the Greek word in the Bible means um, an assembling together. So we are the church. So when I speak of church, the true church, I speak of people. Then it also spoke about the ch um, child which represented Jesus, the seed. And so we saw that particularly in Revelation 12 verses 1 to 5. And we, if you want to look at more detail of that, please go back to the recordings that we have. And then the dragon is identified as Satan in Revelation 12 verses 3 and 9. And then what we, we summarised when we looked at Revelation 12, this is what we found. Is it actually goes through the whole amazing journey of um, the history through, um, of God's church through history. And so it gave us some key glimpses of events that we looked at. And we actually looked at three attempts that Satan had to, to, to attack God's people and then how there was deliverance. Or should I say, one of them was that, that Christ was, was delivered, died on the cross, ascended to heaven and escaped, escaped. Hence why my title, The Great Escape. And so we saw a pattern throughout Revelation 12 that God's people faced attempted attacks by Satan, but they also had the great escapes and deliverances. And so we saw the pattern that a loving God, God's people are saved because Jesus wins and Satan loses. And so this pattern gives us hope for the future for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow his ways. Because Jesus wins and Satan loses. Open your Bibles with me to Revelation 12 and the very last verse there, please. Where we left off is really crucial with what we actually look at today in Revelation 13. Revelation 12 verse 17, if somebody's got that, could you please um, read that out with a loud voice? It doesn't matter which version you have, but Revelation 12 and verse, um, verse 17, please. And the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and their testimony to Jesus. Mm. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Mm. So what do we see here? We see here at, at the very end of Revelation 12 that these attacks that Satan has attempted 
have failed. There have been escapes and deliverances of God's people. And so now the dragon's enraged with the woman and with God's true people because the, the attacks have failed. And so the, it leads the, to a final attack on the rest of her offspring. Who keep, in other words, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And so today we're going to explore this final attempted attack and the significance of the three angels' messages in relation to the final deliverance that happens. The final deliverance, the great escape, part three. And so our big picture has been all the way through, coming back to it. Our big picture is this. God's deliverances give assurance that those who follow God's ways will experience ultimate deliverance, the great escape, since Jesus wins and Satan loses. And so as we move into Revelation 13, it now slows down and looks very specifically at, at this key area. The, the, Revelation 12 gave us glimpses of events and now this is all pulled together but slowed down a little bit in Revelation 13. And so here we look specifically at Satan and his agents attempting a final attack on God's true faithful people. And what we see here is there a, there's a mention of a dra the, the dragon. If we look at verse, chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, could somebody read that out loud, please? Then I saw on the sand Sorry. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Thank you. And so we see here there is a beast coming out of where? Out of the sea. So we're calling it called the sea beast or, or the beast that comes out of the sea. And he receives what from the dragon? Knowing the dragon is Satan. But in verse 2, towards the end, it tells us what the dragon gives him. Or gives... Authority. Yes. Power. Gives power... His throne and great authority. Three key things there. Three key things. And so he, the dragon is behind all of this. So we can say that he's now taken on another agent to go, hey, I failed these attacks or these attacks have failed. I need more help. You could almost say it that way. Kind of. But either way, the sea beast is doing something that is that where the dragon is behind this, where Satan is behind this. And it says in verse 4 that all the world marveled and followed the beast. And verse 4, sorry, verse 3. And then verse 4 it says, so they worshipped the dragon who had given the authority to the beast. So here what we start seeing is that there is, it's about worship. It's about worship. Not to God, but to who? The but to the dragon. Not to God, but to the dragon. And then he goes on in verse 5 that he was given a mouth speaking great things. And when he opened his mouth, there was blasphemy against God. And what are the three areas that he blasphemes against? In verse 6. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. So he blasphemes against God's name. Blasphemes God's name. 
God's tabernacle or sanctuary, and as we were studying even this morning, that the sanctuary was where God would dwell, but it was also a place of worship. It was the place of where forgiveness happened, where um, things pointed to Jesus. And this is a turning away, trying to turn away from what God has done, what Jesus has done. Um, it's taking over what and, and, and turning in the other direction away from God, but to, to the dragon. And he blasphemes, Peter, you said there, your version says the saints. It doesn't say that, I just interpreted that. Oh, okay. Those who dwell in heaven. Those who dwell in heaven. Okay, mine says, yeah, those who dwell in heaven. Okay. And so he takes this on and he actually blasphemes against God by taking on the name, God's tabernacle and sanctuary, and then those who dwell in heaven, those who, those who you could probably say, you know, support, support God. They're on God's side, that worship God. And then verse 7, it says, It was granted to him, the sea beast, the sea beast to make war with the saints and to overcome them. In other words, the saints, the offspring of the woman, those who are the true faithful ones of God, God's people, to overthrow them, to overcome, to, to overcome them, to overthrow them. And catch this, it says there, and authority was given him, as into the sea beast, over every tribe, tongue and nation over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that. And then if we look down to verse 8, and I know there's a lot in this space, and unfortunately today we don't, we're not going to go into all this detail because there is so much within this one chapter that we could pull out, so much. But I'm wanting to give you another view uh, overview so that we then know how this relates to the three angels messages or how the three angels messages relate to revelation 12 and 13 and then in verse 8 he says all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names are what not written in the book of life that's right not written in the book of life of the lamb that was slain in other words what it's saying is that, that um, all who dwell on the earth will worship and their names are not written in the book of life. Revelation 20 speaks of those who are written in the book of life, whose names are written in the book of life, and they are the ones who are amongst those who are saved. And so here it speaks about that their names are not written in the book of life. And they worship the beast, the sea beast, and they ultimately worship the dragon. And then verse 9, it's really interesting how it's just brief, brief, but important. It says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Such a short line with so much meaning to it. Why? Because when we hear, we are then put into a position where we need to choose what is going to be our response. When we hear something, we're in a position of what are we going to choose? How are we going to respond? And interestingly, verse 10 tells us that those who do hear, this is kind of how it's interpreted, those who do hear and respond, in verse 10 it finishes with, here are the patience and the faith of the saints. In other words, there are some who do respond. Do respond to the true and right worship. Then we move on to verse 11 to 18. Now 
where there's a second agent that the dragon employs. And it's the land beast, so a beast that comes out of the land. And so what we see here in verse 11, it says he had two horns like a lamb, spoke like a dragon. Horns in the Bible represent power. They represent power. And so what we're seeing here is that there's a man-made system or system that is has got power but then also it says that they spoke and is like a lamb but speaks like a dragon and so it's got power it's got horns it's like a lamb and when you look in the bible of course we know that the lamb pointed towards christ towards jesus the the, the ultimate sacrifice. And so it's, it's a Christ-like power that is supposedly innocent. And he exercises in verse 12 and 13, exercises all authority of the first beast, so the sea beast, and in the presence of the sea beast. And then he performs signs and wonders and so this land beast links up with the sea beast who is linked up with the dragon and so what do we see here yes we see a triunity or we use the term trinity sometimes and when we think of Trinity, we often think of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But what are we seeing here is a tr satanic triunity. And, they and, and the land breeze performs signs impersonating the, impersonating the power of God, and he causes an image to be made to the sea beast, and so worship is enforced. And you can read about that also then what happens in verse 16 to 18. So here we see that there is attempted attack onto God's people. An attempted attack onto God's people. So what have the three angels' messages got to do with what we see in Revelation 13? And ideally, it'd be great to dig even deeper into Revelation 13. So like I said, there's two beasts and the dragon, the three, which causes the triunity and they have a united, they are united in purpose. And so what do the three angels' messages have to do with this? that there is deliverance, the greatest escape from Satan's attacks. And that these three angels' messages are warning messages to the world to escape this attack. That there may be deliverance for all, not for some, but for all when Jesus comes. How do we know that? Well, Revelation 14 is divided into, sorry, go back, has got three sections within Revelation 14. And again, we'll just touch on it. It talks about the Lamb and God's faithful people in verses 1 to 5. Because they have their name written on their, the father's name written on their foreheads in verse 1. They sing a new song at the throne of God. We find that in verse 3. They follow the lamb who is Jesus and they are found without fault before the throne. Verse 5. And so 
it's a symbolic number that is spoken of with the 144,000 that are seen there with the lamb who is Jesus. And this, that, this symbolizes those who survive the onslaught of this triunity of, this, of the dragon, the sea beast and the land beast. And then we see the three angels' messages right there. And in some ways, it would probably, just like in Revelation 12, where we saw an intermission of the history of the church that suddenly went to looking at the war in heaven, we kind of get this intermission of this, what happens at the right end of time, and we get this intermission of going, hey, but there's an important message to get to the world so that there are those who are um, part of those who are, survive the onslaught of the satanic triunity. And so it's understandable then that the focus of the three angels' messages relates to worship. And so what we see with the triun satanic triunity is this. The sea beast has authority over every tribe. Sorry, I've doubled up there. Tribe is meant to be once. Tribe, tongue and nation. The three angels' messages warning. The first angels' message is an everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue and people. The satanic triunity looks at, at focuses on worship. The three angels' messages focus on worship. The satanic triunity, the focus of worship is all who dwell on the earth worship the sea beast to the dragon whose names have not been found to worship in the Lamb's book of life. And the three angels' messages speak of Babylon, which we talked about earlier, is, um, is about self-exaltation. It's a system, a man-made system that is about self and taking the focus away from God rather than towards God. And so the three angels' messages in, in, in um, the second angel's message particularly, looks Babylon is identified by the opposition, the first angel's of, um, by opposition, those who oppose the first angel's everlasting gospel and, um, and the creator God. So those who follow Babylon's ways, man's, the, the man-made system ways, oppose the first angel's message and also um, therefore worship to the creator God. And the satanic... Triunity also attempts for evil and destruction of salvation of all earth dwellers. Of all earth dwellers. The beautiful thing is the three angels' messages focus on good restoration and salvation of all earth dwellers. Isn't that beautiful? It's such an important message that we've got to get to the world, the three angels' messages. And so when you look at this, when you look at the satanic triunity and you look at the three angels' messages, and this is where I was going from the start of the three-part series. Here's the thing. The three angels' messages are therefore God's counter move and response to the satanic triunity. They are God's response. And we are the servants that He wants to use to get the message to the world. He wants us to get the message to the world because it's God's response and counter move to the satanic triunity. 
And so it makes sense then that the three warning messages focus on worship. The creator of heaven and earth deserves all worship, all praise. And every single dweller on this earth deserves salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Every single dweller on this earth deserves salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's why God has called you and I as believers to take the message to the world so that all are saved and none are lost. knowing that then it continues in Revelation 14, and this is the third part, talks about a reaping of a harvest. And sadly, there will be some, there will be two groups. There will be those who are saved and sadly those who are lost when Jesus comes. But when he comes... There'll be the greatest deliverance, the greatest escape ever from the clutches of Satan, from the tri-satanic triunity. Revelation 14, sorry, before I go there. As believers and followers of Jesus Christ, it is our privilege and it is our duty to share the three angels' messages with everyone on this earth. Revelation 14, 12, just turn there with me if you can, please, as we come towards our conclusion. And it says here in Revelation 14, 12, here are the patience of the saints here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Do you want to be amongst the saved, but not just alone, but with others that you've shared this message of hope with? Others who have come to Jesus, others who Jesus, God, has transformed, others who, who then also want to go out and share with others this message, this three angels' message, that Jesus is coming, this everlasting gospel, that each one can be saved. And so in summary to tie all of our three parts together. Revelation 12 showed the pattern of Satan's attempted attacks on Jesus, the Son of God, and God's people, and the great escapes or deliverances that occurred through, through, throughout church history. Revelation 13 showed us that the, there's, shows the satanic trinity's attempt to attack God's faithful people and to allure as many others who have not yet made a decision for Christ to his side, to the dragon's side. And Revelation 14 shows that those who follow the Lamb and are redeemed are called to proclaim the three angels' messages. And so what are the... Th What's the significance of the three angels' messages? As we said, they are God's counter move. They are God's response to the satanic triunity. The Great Escape on the 24th of March, 1944, happened only not long 
before freedom would have been given to these escapees because the war ended soon after. Sadly though, only, se only, 76, only 76 men escaped through the tunnel. But sadly, sadly it did not end in a great escape. Since 73 of the 76 escapees were recaptured within two weeks following a massive manhunt by the Nazis. Only three truly escaped and were never caught. Moving into this year. Moving into this year. Questions we've had each time is how do you choose to live your life? The second one is what do you need to do differently this year to ensure you have a deeper and more consistent walk with Jesus? Thirdly, is it your desire to prepare for Jesus' second coming? And if so, how will you prepare? And finally, how will you share the three angels' messages with others in your family and your community so they are amongst the saved when Jesus comes again? Our big picture or main idea is this. God's deliverances give assurance that those who follow God's ways will experience ultimate deliverance, the greatest escape since Jesus wins and Satan loses. May we all be win on the winning side, but not alone. May our families, our friends, those in our community, those that we share the message with and those to whom we are Jesus. It's not about just the words we share, but it's who we are. That they'll come to know a loving God and experience eternal life when Jesus comes is my prayer.